So finally, let's come to the different valuation approaches which you find in the real world. Let's face it, there is an endless supply of valuation approaches. And you can see here now, I have listed four approaches. Mm. Clearly, there are more. There are derivatives of the ones I'm using here. There are some totally different ones in there. However, I don't want to go here to the third derivative in terms of valuation theory. The topic here has to be if you actually get yourself an analyst report, for example, an analyst covering Apple, and this Apple concludes that Apple is over or undervalued. We need to make sure that you understand the logic of the analyst in there. And these four approaches are the approaches I feel uh, very widely used in this world. And we have to make sure that the general underlying idea of those approaches actually becomes clear. So understanding an analyst report, understanding the real world, understanding the Financial Times Lex column, a very important part of the Financial Times. The last page of the hardcover version of the Financial Times has the Lex column in it, where they discuss exactly kind of back of the envelope calculations, and they discuss if a business is over or undervalued. So if you look at those four methodologies we have, we will now go over every one of those and understand hopefully what their intention is. So let's start off with substance valuation, a very, very old way of valuing a business. So what do you do with the substance valuation? You ask yourself, well, what is the substance of a given company? And how do you do that? you actually ask yourself the assets the company owns. How much are those assets actually worth? What is important is that the value of the assets is nothing you can see in the balance sheet or on the balance sheet. Why? Because on the balance sheet, you have values which are basically valued on beautiful IFRS US GAAP accounting rules. But that does not mean that this is the actual value. Yes, accounting is clearly moving in the direction of mark to market. So we're seeing more and more items there as market values, but definitely not all of them. So if you, for example, look at a company like a railway company, usually you see the fixed assets, which is the railway track, put on the balance sheet at cost. So whatever it actually did cost you to value this business is not an issue. It is what if you have you put in in terms of cost minus the depreciation. This is in the book values. We want to value the business based on market values. So here the issue is if you put up this railway and the tracks yeah, on sale, would somebody buy it? And what would be the value of those different asset positions in there. Keep in mind what we said about equity and entity value. So whenever you actually value the left side of the balance sheet in terms of market values, you have the issue that there is also debt coming with the company. So if you have a value of the assets of 100 million, if you have debt of 40 million, you would have to deduct the 40 million to get a net value. Here you have the two differentiation, gross and net, in this case of 60. Yeah, so the important part is this, these are the market value of the different asset positions. It's not the accounting values which you have here. Now, analysts have a different name for substance value. They also call it sometimes breakup value or liquidation value. So if you liquidate the company, what do you get for it? Or if you break up the company into different parts, how much money do you actually get for it? You can see where this logic comes from. This logic comes from, yeah, 100 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, where we had lots of companies owning lots of assets, railway companies, steel companies, chemical companies. There, in those kind of industries, you can maybe play this kind of valuation approach in there. If you look in today's world and all the world of digitalization and service industries, 
comes into the game in here. Then you're talking more about those kind of companies in here. No, I mean, who is this? Yeah, I think probably most people have seen the slide here. No, obviously this is the guy everybody knows, no? Yeah, Bill Gates and uh, here's Paul Allen, no? Just died recently, definitely one of the brains of Microsoft. So this is the founding team of Microsoft. Now, how much substance did this company have? Yeah, I mean, look at those guys. No, what would you find in substance? Yeah, probably loads of Mariana and the garage of Bill Gates' father. But that's about it. And that's obviously happening now in many parts of the world where, for example, Switzerland, 70% of Switzerland is now service-oriented. The economy of Switzerland is a service economy. If you value a service company, let's say McKinsey consulting company, well, what would you find in a service company? Well, you would find people. Do we put people on the balance sheet? No, we stopped that after the end of the American Civil War. You don't own people anymore. Thanks God. Yeah. So for a service company, if you look at McKinsey, what would you find as substance value? You would find, yeah, probably five PCs and 10 company cars or least probably. So the only thing they have in their balance sheet is probably accounts receivable and a bit of cash. So the idea of valuing McKinsey based on the substance of the balance sheet, it's a total joke. Clearly, McKinsey has a name because you can charge a much higher daily charging rate if you have McKinsey in a business card compared to Otto Meyer Consulting in there. So this doesn't capture our brave new world. However, having said this, we have seen, even in the last 20 years, some transactions which actually had in the background the idea of the buyer that I buy this company not to actually go on with its business, I just want to have access to the assets and will sell off those assets. I hope you see a little bit the danger here of the substance valuation. We in our part of the world, Europe, continental Europe, Germany, Switzerland, we love substance. The more substance a company has, the better. If you understand this logic here, having a lot of substance, but not having great future prospects for the development of the company, might turn you into the perfect takeover target. Why? Because the stock market values the future. The future doesn't really look that great. So then your value in the stock market comes down. And at some point, it might come down so much that the typical raider might come in and buy you, not because this person likes your business, but because this person actually wants to take the big hammer and basically sell all the assets. There are an awful lot of American films which show that. Some of you might remember Pretty Woman. Surprisingly, Pretty Woman has a business story in it. Yeah. If you remember that film, there's a love story, but there's also a business story. Richard Gere comes to Los Angeles and wants to buy a shipyard. Not because he wants to buy, to build ships. What does he want to do? He wants to take over this company and use the real estate of the company, which is prime real estate in Long Beach, and build condominiums. So what happened there? Koreans got in the shipbuilding market. American shipbuilders actually lost their shirt. That actually reflected in the stock price of those companies coming down. And there you have exactly those kind of raiders coming in. Here in Switzerland, Winterthur is a classical place where exactly that happened with Russian money flowing in, taking over these old industrial companies, not because they were interested in the business. They wanted to have the real estate. So the message is, when somebody starts to discuss substance value of your company, this somebody doesn't want to go on doing your business, this somebody wants to take the hammer and actually sell off different parts. So that's approach number one. Approach number two, analyst favorites. This is what people call a multiple-based approach. What is multiple-based approach? Well, I can tell you what the advantage is of this approach. It is a very simple approach. Even my nine-year-old daughter can do evaluation based on multiples. Unfortunately, it has about as much financial know-how in it as my nine-year-old daughter 
has in her thinking, which is basically zero. However, as this is such an easy approach, analysts love it and people love to discuss multiples in a given industry. So how does that work? You go in and you define one magic number. And this magic number could be EBIT, it could be EBITDA. And you ask yourself, in this given industry, how much times or how many times this magic number is a company in this given industry actually worse? This is something which is very commonly used in the real estate industry. So when you ask yourself, for example, if an apartment, a house, which you would like to buy, if this one is expensive or is actually relatively cheap, then real estate people oftentimes compare your annual rent income from buying this apartment. Let's assume you get an annual rent income of 1,000 Swiss francs from this apartment. And then you ask yourself, if I want to buy it, how many times do I have to pay this annual rent income to buy the apartment? So let's have an example. 1,000 Swiss francs is the annual rent income. And you have to, have, to, have to multiply it times 30 to find out what the price currently is for this apartment. 30 is a number which in the real estate industry Many people feel, oh, that's a bit on the upper side. They have ideas that this should be more like maybe 20 in there. However, if you look at the current discussion about real estate in many big cities, going up to the roof, if you want to buy yourself an apartment in Munich, you have to pay 60 times the annual rent income, where many people say that's ridiculous. And maybe this is ridiculous. So this gives you an impression of the relationship of this one magic number, which is the enterprise specific metric. So in our case, it was the rental income you get from buying the apartment or the house, 1000, times the multiplier of 30. Yeah, So you would get to then a price of 30,000 for that particular house in there. So you can obviously take rental income for an apartment, for companies, you oftentimes take EBITDA, EBIT, net income, or, and that's maybe one of the funniest examples of uh, multipliers, that you can actually use non-financial numbers as well. If you think back, the glorious times of dot-coms. What happened to dot-coms? Dot-coms didn't have EBIT. They didn't have EBITDA. They oftentimes didn't even have sales. So then the big question came up, how do you value a dot-com? Even so, there's really no income statement, just big losses in there. And then people had the glorious ideas, let's take non-financial figures. The most famous one during the dot-com phase was number of hits on your website times X gives you the value of the company. So the moment you posted a beautiful picture on your website, you are valuation actually went up. However, the dot-com maybe shows you that somebody just dreaming up such a multiplier, number of hits on your website times X gives you the value of the company, leads to strategic changes in many companies. Why? If you know that the moment you go to the stock market, somebody will value you with X times the hits on your website, then the logic strategic imperative becomes, let's actually create as many hits on your website as possible. And if you see what that meant in, for example, the publishing industry was that you actually opened up your website for everybody for free. You could actually get all the content of all those publisher websites, newspaper content for free. So we have a generation of users who got acquainted to that, hey, the content of a website has to be for free. The idea originally was, well, wait, at some point we will monetize this. And you can see even now, 20 years after the dot-com bubble, the publishers still have a very hard time to monetize this because the moment you then put up paywalls where people have to pay something for the hit, 
people say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just switch to another news website in there. Yeah? So you can see there's a link that you declare one number into a holy number, and then everybody maximizes this particular number. So this would be a classic example, number of hits on the website. Another possibility would be number of users, yeah, or in the hotel industry, number of beds times X. So many industries have certain metrics based on experience that you actually say in our industry, we pay two times net sales, yeah, or five times EBITDA. And people have this number in the back of their head. I hope you see as well what that means. That's something I learned in my MBA. How do you become rich? You found a company and on the very first day of founding your company, you actually think, if I sell my companies in three or four or five years, how will I be valued by the potential buyer of my company? And then I think about what kind of metrics are applied in my industry. And if I learn, for example, that in my industry, people usually pay X times net sales, then it's clear what that means. You actually will focus on sales, sales, sales for the next years in order to fetch a high price for your business. If its, answer, it's number hits on your website, you actually focus on creating web traffic and hits on your website. Yeah, so there is a link actually between somebody dreaming up those numbers and management going after those numbers. So you can see here we have two types of multiples here. We have market multiples. That is what you see in the newspapers, how many times profit a given company is actually worth in there. And then we have transaction multiples. What is that? This is KPMG or PwC, Ernst & Young, going in and telling you, we had in the last three, four, five years, so and so many transactions in such an industry. Those were private transactions. Actually, the data was not disclosed, but we can tell you on average, the buyer paid six times EBITDA in there. And then this number again becomes kind of a holy number. So market multiples, transaction multiples hmm. in there. Then a second differentiation is historical multiples. So when we take multiples based on number of hits in your website, do we take last year's hits on the website? This would be historical or trailing multiples. Or do we take next year's hits on your website? So we do a planning assumption in there. Yeah, so we're looking a little bit in the future. So this is, these are two categories, market transaction, historical and forward which you will actually find if you see a multiple, there might be a footnote on which basis the multiple was created based on historic information, based on market information. This helps you to understand what the basis of the valuation was. Now, coming back to our differentiation between net and gross enterprise value, net and gross. You remember that, that we have two different values for the company? Now, different multiples lead to different outcomes. You remember that the net enterprise value is what people call the market capitalization in there. If you want to know the market capitalization of a company and you want to know the underlying multiple, the classical one would be the price earnings ratio. The price earnings ratio is a number which is including the interest. It is based on net income. So let's understand net income. Net income is the final line of your income statement. So at net income, you've already deducted the interest expenses for the debt. So that means debt is already taken care of. So if you take net income, you come to the net enterprise value, which is the value excluding the debt of the company. On the other hand, if you take a number before interest, so what would that be? This would be, for example, EBIT. If you base your valuation based on EBIT, EBIT is a number before interest. So EBIT excludes the interest, actually. So if you take an EBIT 
multiplier, you actually get the gross value of the company and not the net value of the company. Now, from the previous video, you know that you always can make sure that uh, you have a bridge between net and gross value, and that is a debt in there. So really, a PE ratio and an EBIT uh, multiplier should be explainable by their different based on the debt of the company. So what is the conclusion here? Whenever you see a multiple, you basically have to ask, is this multiple leading to the net value of the company or is this value leading to the gross value of the company? You will see that analysts actually prefer gross multiples. So this part here. Why is that? Because gross parts leave out exactly this kind of debt financing component. However, if you look at your newspaper, if you, for example, take Neue Zürcher Zeitung, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, they actually like to live, look at um, the P ratio, which is actually this side here. Why is that? Because at the end, net income is the number which is easiest available for all companies. If you don't publish anything about your finances except net income, then of course I take net income as the basis in there. So that is the reason why retail investors love to look at PE ratios because the number is readily available. Whereas analysts, financial analysts, usually prefer more EBITDA multiple, EBIT multiple, yeah, which then actually lead to the gross value of the company. All right, multiples. Yeah, I hope you see nice and easy way to value a business. However, the big however is, I think if I would tell you that you can buy right now this house here in New York, and I would just tell you, you know what? In New York, we usually pay 40 times rental income. You would not just believe me. You would go further. You would go into the house, check out how old is the heating system. Do we need to actually repaint the kitchen in there? You would find out the state of the house in there and make your adjustments and tell me as a seller, you know what? The heating system is sold. We need to replace it. We need to deduct this from actually the purchase price. This is stuff which you don't see if you do a multiple valuation in there. If you actually look into the future in detail, by doing a business plan, how much rental income you will have in this house and how much the expenses actually are to renovate it. This is some, what people call a discounted future approach. Future in terms of what? In our part of the world, we prefer to discount future earnings, future profits. And this is what you have here. You have the discounted profits approach. Now, if you think about profits, there are various profits, various problems with profits, which is they are basically one stated of opinions. So, for example, the question of how you depreciate an asset impacts your profit. And as a finance guy, one thing I've learned in my finance class in my MBA is that really what matters is cash. So that is the reason why, for me, I love that this approach is now the first approach which actually looks in the future and forces you to think about how the future will develop for this particular company, for this particular asset you're about to buy. This is definitely a big step forward compared to multiples. However, I would not base it on profits. I would base it on cash in, cash out, which would be the discounted cash flow approach. And I think if I took something out of my own MBA is that basically every question you look at in a business is a discounted cash flow question. So how much do I need to spend today and how much do I get back over the next years? If you look at the valuation of a French fry stand, probably profit and cash is pretty close to each other. But if you look at the valuation of, for example, an energy company, a utility which owns nuclear power plant, there's a big difference between cash and profit. Why? Because the big investments for buying a nuclear power plant or building a nuclear power plant 
profit-wise only shows up when you start depreciating this asset. However, the investment amount actually is a negative cash out for you the moment you start building it. And I think for my grandmother, it's very clear, I want to have a return on an investment the moment I undertake the investment, not the moment I start depreciating it. So you go to your bank and you invest $100 in a fund. You want to have a return on $100 the day you invest it. You wouldn't accept that the bank tells you, yeah, we spread up the $100 you gave us right now over 10 years and we only start to give you a return yeah, once we've actually started to apportion it over the 10 years in there. So to me, the logic of doing evaluation on the question of, hey, how much cash comes in and goes out year by year by year, this is really the way I would value an asset or a company. And I love Warren Buffett. For the fact that he can express such relatively complicated things in very simple terms. And I don't think there is anything to add to what Buffett is actually saying here. Yeah, this is exactly what we're driving at here. So you need to actually plan the future cash you can take out of the business. But you need to ask yourself how much this cash is worth today. And this is exactly what we had here as well. We talked about discounting future profits. Now, the only difference here is Buffett is talking about discounting future cash flows in there. But the idea to kind of ask yourself, a cash flow I get in five years, how much is this cash flow worth today? It makes sense. And that is, again, something my grandmother understands that a euro you get today has a higher value than a euro you get in five years in there. That's what we reflect with the discounting part, which is a cornerstone of financing in here. Now, I told you I love what Buffett is saying here. However, we are obviously an academic institution. We cannot talk such plain English. We have to express the whole thing in a bit more difficult terms. And that's what you see down here. Yeah. So this is what people call the DCF approach. And this is to me, one of the crucial messages of any finance course that whatever you look at is basically based on future cash generation. And we can make this link, the final link here to your MBA program. If you think, think about an MBA, at the end of the day, an MBA program has exactly those elements. What is the value of an MBA degree? Well, it is no surprise that the most important criterion from Financial Times is salary increase three years after graduation. Why is that? Because at the end of the day, this is a DCF valuation as well. You pay something to the school, you don't actually have an income for one or two years in there. So why would you do that if you wouldn't be increasing your income in the next years? Yeah, and comparing the cash out to the cash ins. This then gives you a hint of the economic viability of an MBA program. Now, I would hope life has more dimensions than just discounted cash flow, but clearly this is an issue we as an MBA program have to make sure that there is this increase in value for you. So that there is actually a positive outcome from your discounted cash flow analysis. So whatever you look at in a company, buying another company, doing a training seminar for your employees, introducing a product is basically valued in financial terms on the question of what is the cash out today? What is the cash in tomorrow? If I now discount the future cash flows to today's value, does it make sense that we actually do invest this money into the company, into the training program, into the MBA? All right, folks, this is something which needs to be practiced obviously a lot in there. If you work for a large company, I hope you can see already in your beautiful investment proposals exactly this kind of logic. And if you actually go and read the Financial Times, you will see a lot of this logic actually happening when they discuss actually how a company should be valued. All right, this was it. And I would hope that we now have the basis to actually enter in a bit more valuation discussions.